I grew up in a heavily Jewish neighborhood in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, most of my neighbors were Jewish. Um, the neighborhoods around were Jewish. And I can remember one Friday evening, early, walking to my church for the Boy Scouts meeting. I was in Boy Scouts. And uh, a woman uh, was sitting on her porch and she said, the young man, would, would you come up and turn on my lights? Uh, that's kind of peculiar, going to her house to turn on her lights and uh, being young uh, and not always trusting everybody. And I said, no, 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 I, I can't do that. And I went on my way. And then I realized, of course, what it was. It was the Sabbath was coming and it was against her law, as it were, to do anything of work. It was the nature of work and turning on the lights constituted that for her. The Mishnah, which was uh, written in the third century, was to collect all the, the laws concerning the Sabbath and other things so that they wouldn't be lost because they were basically passed on orally and now they needed to be written down. And uh, the last category of laws to be observed on the Sabbath is called the final completion laws. There were 39 sets of laws. That's the last one. And for instance, this is the kind of thing that was in there, or would be in there today, if the pages of a newspaper that you got were stuck together, you know, sometimes it, it didn't cut all the way, and you used a knife to cut it, that's final completion. So that's work on the Sabbath. You've got some noodle soup. It's already prepared, but you have to add water, hot water to it. No, that's against the law because the Sabbath law, because that's final completion. You've got a guitar, and one of the strings is out of tune. Ah, you can't tune it on the Sabbath because the final completion of the instrument, that's work. Of course, I grew up, as some of you did, with many blue laws where you couldn't open stores on Sunday, you couldn't uh, do work, you weren't supposed to do work on Sunday. The kind of the, the Jewish Sabbath had been transferred to the Christian's Sunday. I remember our pastor, whom we loved deeply, he was 40 years, the pastor of the church where Fran and I both grew up, and uh, he would not take a newspaper on Sundays because he didn't want the newsboy to have to deliver paper on Sunday and maybe miss Sunday school. He did go to restaurants though on Sunday. <laughs> so, you know, it was an interesting phenomenon. They watched Jesus. They watched him closely. Would Jesus cure this man on Sabbath? The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day, Saturday, is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, you shall not do any work. You know, it's interesting, this seven-day week, I've done some research on that, but it doesn't match anything astronomically. You know, the moon is roughly as a month, as if the moon's changed, the year, of course, is the time it takes to go around the sun, a day is it the rotation of the earth, all those things are tied to astronomical things that happen and we can observe. In fact, uh, the Romans uh, had an eight day week. The Jews had a seventh day week. Keeping the Sabbath was a sign they were God's people. That and circumcision, they were the two signs. Exodus 31 says, keeping the Sabbath day is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel. So they watched him closely. That's, that's a technical word. It's not just they looked at him or, or watched him. They, they watched in anticipation. It's tied up in the word and the tense itself. What's he going to do? This is something they did often. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus is in the house of a leader of the Pharisees and is to eat a meal on the Sabbath. And they were, again, it's the same word they were watching him closely. What would he do? They watched him closely. Would he violate their understanding of the Sabbath? Their purpose, of course, is legalistic. 
can I still do it all? I'm feeling vengeful, really. Jesus' action will turn out to be based on love and concern. There's quite a contrast. Jesus, just before this incident, had said the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And then he brings up what David did. Most scholars don't believe he brought it up just because it would be a counterexample. Well, you know, I did it good. David did it after all. There's a reason for bringing up David. David's son was to be Messiah. The son of man was the son of David. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus uh, poses a question to the Pharisees. How can the scribes say that Messiah is the son of David? Jesus said, David himself, by the Holy Spirit, in one of the Psalms, declares, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So Jesus poses a, a riddle. David himself calls him Lord, so how can it be his son? Of course, we know how. He was both the son of God and the son of man, the son of David. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath, Jesus said. As an application of that principle, the Christian church early on moved our idea of the special day from Saturday to Sunday. That first indication of that is in the book of Revelation where the Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And evidently the people to whom he was writing, the seven churches in, in Asia Minor, knew what the Lord's day meant. So there was already a concept of the Lord's day. By the mid-second century, that'd be, you know, roughly 150, Justin Martyr wrote of the first, or sometimes they call it the eighth day, because it was the day of new creation, the eighth day of creation, as it were. Uh, he called that uh, not a day of rest so much, but a day to gather for worship, the Lord's day. And then 321, Constantine, as the emperor, declared that Sunday was to be the Roman day of rest. Interestingly, when I was living in Pakistan, you would have thought Friday would be the day off because you know Muslims worship on Friday, but Sunday was the day off. It was made that way by the dictator who was still dictator when I was there. Uh, and the reason being, the rest of the world <laughs> is on Sunday. And we want to compete economically. We want to be involved economically so they and Sunday is the day off, which is great because then there wasn't a lot of traffic when we drove to, to the place where we worship. Later in the church, of course, Sunday began to be treated as a Sabbath. And I mentioned that. I mentioned the blue laws, although they were defended by the courts because it was justice for the working person. Uh, but many Christians began to treat the, uh, the Sabbath with the same kind of legalism, probably many of you are familiar with that, as was the old Jewish sect. They treated Sunday that way, the Lord's Day. That must have happened even in the time of the apostles because Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter four, now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you want to be enslaved by them again? You're observing, by the way, that's the same word as watching closely, special days, months, seasons, and years. I'm afraid that my, my work for you has been wasted. Why Paul's concern about them observing days and seasons? Hebrews chapter 4, I think, makes that very clear. He talks about a Sabbath rest, the writer which is identified with salvation. Therefore, he says, while the promise of entering God's rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For indeed, the good news came to us just as it did to them, talking about the Jews of that day. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed Entered the rest. In other words, we're saved by grace. That's what the writers say. That was Paul's concern. Not by any works, not any good works, 
Not even keeping the Sabbath as if it were a Sabbath, or keeping the Lord's Day as if it were a Sabbath. But having said that, it, it was one of the commandments, after, almost the fourth commandment. One day set apart in the rhythm of life seems to be God's plan. I think we all need to respect that. We pastors often were encouraged, take a day off. You can't take Sunday off normally. We used to have services several times that day. Maybe pastoral calls. Take another day. Make sure you get a day of rest. That's, that's the cycle that God seems to have built into humanity. That's what Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for humankind. Not humankind for the Sabbath. It isn't that the Sabbath is there to put constraints on you. It's for your sake. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was probably the greatest preacher in the 19th century, he was a Baptist, but he was reformed. So he was a good Baptist. <laughs> he said this. He said many great things. He was a great guy. I'm no preacher of the old legal Sabbath, he said. I'm a preacher of the gospel, the good news, and rejoice that believers are not under the law, but under the grace. Therefore, I keep this day, Sunday, not as a slavish bondage, not as a day in which I'm chained and hampered with restraints against my will, but as a day in which I may take holy pleasure in serving God and in enduring before his throne. The Lord's day of the Christian is a joy, a day of rest, of peace, and of thanksgiving. I sometimes would say, you know, hey, I can look at my long grass and I don't have to cut it today. It's the Lord's day, so I'm not going to cut it. A freedom, as it were. But sometimes you have to cut it on. The Lord's day, that's all you got. And then Spurgeon goes on and says, In vain you keep the day unless your hearts keep it too. Oh, may your hearts know how to find in Christ a perfect rest. May God give you divine grace to know your sin and enable you to fly to the Savior and find in him all your soul needs. May he enable you to rest in Christ today. Then you shall keep Sabbath on earth till you keep the eternal Sabbath before the throne. Trust him, and so shall you be saved, and your spirit shall be at ease. Is it lawful, Jesus said, to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? And they were silent. Indifference. That's one of the most terrible of sins indifference. Nothing's more harmful in our society than, than people's silence, than leaders' silence about things that are wrong. People are wanting an empathy for others' pain. So Jesus looked around at them with anger. I want to experience Jesus' anger. It's the same word, wrath. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by wickedness suppress the truth. The judgment at the end, John sees heaven open with a white horse. And the rider is called faithful and true. And later he's called the king of kings and lord of lords. We have no doubt who that is. But he tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. So, Jesus' anger is nothing to be messed with, that's for sure. He was grieved at the hardness of their hearts, their stubborn hearts, their callous hearts. The greatest enemy of divine love would be hard hearted. They had lost all sensitivity to the needs of others. They were no longer distressed because of someone else's distress. Jesus is grieved at that. Boy, the balance here. Angry, but I'm grieved. I'm angry at what you're doing to others, but I'm grieved that you have such a hard heart. You know, it's, it's really compassion on both. The compassion on the people that need to know the love of this person who's so hard hearted, and at the same time, I'm grieved that you're like that. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. It's not just legal to heal on the Sabbath, it's right, Jesus is saying, by his action. The man, of course, was a pawn for their anger, for their vengeance against Jesus. 
And for Jesus, he was an object of compassion. Is it lawful to do good or to harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? That's why I read Isaiah 58. Here are people concerned about God recognizing they're fasting, they're doing the good things, they're doing the right things. And God, through the prophet, says, it's not this the fast you choose, to loose the bonds of injustice. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked covered? If you call the Sabbath of the light and the holy day of the Lord honor, if you honor it by not going your own ways and serving your own interests, but taking delight in the Lord, you'll ride on the heights of the earth, Isaiah said. What is true religious practice? Not legalism, but the heart. <coughs> body and mind and action and empathy and care for those who are, are hurting the most. James says the same thing in the book of James. Religion that our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after the orphans and the widows <coughs> in their distress. The Sabbath was made for humankind. Jesus said concept of Sabbath was, was not for legal worship. It was a day of weekly rest provided by God's love. The idea of Sabbath is actually a metaphor for heaven. Again, in Hebrews, it says a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through disobedience as theirs did. The day of rest God did seven days labor, he rested. Does that mean he quit working? No. He completed something and then he went on to do other things. I don't look forward to heaven as just laying back on a cloud. I'm sure I won't be playing a harp, but I, I could never master that. Well, maybe I could if I had eternity uh, to do it. But that's not the idea of rest. The idea of rest is having satisfying work. Not working for 30 years of your life in a drudgery job just because you got to pay your bills. It's doing something you really enjoy doing. You can't wait to get there and do it. It's satisfying. You accomplish something. It's rewarding. It's purpose-filled. It, it, it does something worthwhile and you know it. And there are relationships there, good relationships with all those around you, and most of all, with God. That's the image of the day of rest that's promised to all of us who trust in Christ. Matthew 25, 21, you remember those who did what the Master wanted them to do, the ten that made ten, the five, five. His Master said to them, those who did well. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Even more to do. Satisfying things. And then it says, enter the joy of your master. That hymn that Wendy sang for us at the beginning of day of radiant gladness. The last stanza talks about the light of the, of the Lord's day, the light of the Sabbath, that light our hope sustained. We walk the pilgrim way, at length our rest attained, our endless Sabbath day. We would say our endless day of rest. We sing you our praises, O Father, Spirit, Son, the church and voice of praises to you, bless three in one. There is a rest remaining for God's people. Amen.